Hi everyone and welcome to episode 15 of Bucks UK TV. I am joined by our regulars Phil and Gary. Hi. Hello. And also this week we have our special guest. We are super privileged to have Matt Grisham. Hello. How you doing? I love those adjectives, super privileged, much appreciated. Thank you. You're most welcome. So before we get into it, we'll have the usual chat today. Please do subscribe to us. Please do like the video. All those things that get us up the YouTube charts are super important to us. Send us your views to mail at bucksuk.org and you can WhatsApp us on 07311212713. So Matt, I don't think there's any Bucks fan in the world on Facebook that can't have heard of you. You, you know, you have such a large <laughs> social media presence and following. But I guess while we always hear your views of the day, what we don't always hear is the backstory. So um, for those that don't know, you're out in Colorado, aren't you? So, you know, you yes, know what it's like to be watching the Bucks in a different time zone. Tell us, tell yes, us the do. story. Why the Bucks? Um, so essentially, my dad was born in Jacksonville, Florida. And then I have a lot of family, aunts, uncles that uh, are from Clearwater. So kind of, uh, you know, a very close distance to Tampa. Um, so I've just always, you know, as a kid, I loved pirates, what little child doesn't, and obviously the logo. So I always kind of just uh, was drawn to it. And for whatever weird reason, even when we uh, lived here and moved back, I just always stayed loyal to the Buccaneers and have kind of always kept my, you know, affinity for them. And then I became a season ticket holder once I was, you know, a grown adult and made adult money. And I've always just kind of uh, made that a, a weird family vacation thing we do. We usually go on, you know, our normal one or holiday, as you guys call it. And uh, then we go to a Bucks game or, or two, depending on whatever city it is. And um, it really just grew from there where to me it's, you know, and I, I really try to embody that. It's a lot more than just watching around, um, you know, following a football team. It's more just the camaraderie you have with the people you meet like you guys and just the relationships you build with. It's crazy. Some of my friends here in Denver, they don't do what I do, but they're envious of it as in they're like, man, you get to experience things that other people couldn't put a price tag on. And I, I credit that all to just my fellow love as you guys have for the Buccaneers. Absolutely. And it's, it's fantastic to, to say that, um, <clears throat> You know, through the club, it brings people like all of us together across, you know, national boundaries, time zone boundaries. Um, yeah. You know, we're really proud of our, our little club in our corner of the world. And you kind of have some social media stuff going on that, that you oversee. Do you want to give a little plug to any of that? Um, so essentially, I run a uh, my own group. It's called the Cush Couch Chronicles. Um, it started out, I jokingly said earlier, but maybe I wasn't joking. I like to talk a lot. Um, I have uh, a lot of opinions. Sometimes they're far-fetched, sometimes they're credible. It's kind of uh, the beauty of it all. Um, so anyways, yeah, I have a group and um, I sit right here on my cush couch and uh, I just chop it up with all my fellow uh, Buccaneers fans out there that, um, you know, I guess want to talk whatever the subject of the week is. And um, all of us too at the same time kind of have a, a love for uh, recreational marijuana. Uh, that's something that's real big out here in Denver, Colorado, also in other places worldwide. So kind of a little small space within the fan group that if you partake, you know, we have a spot for you to come and hang out and talk about the Bucks and our love for them. Well, we have to remember, we're like the BBC. We have to remain impartial. So we should say other highs are available. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> Um, at which point we <laughs> shall um, crack on then and um, oh, resurrect the dead body that is the Saints game. Mm. Our usual routine we go through is to run through the O, run through the D, run through special teams. And then to uh, to try and have a magic wand moment of what you'd do if you were Bruce Arians. I think maybe first of all, I think, you know, let's just reflect on the game as a whole. Clearly, um, we didn't enjoy it. We weren't happy. Phil, I know you talk a lot about the psychology of the game. And, um, you know, it kind of felt like we just weren't in the game, were we? No, we weren't at all. I, I, I've actually, as I was saying earlier, and I've watched it twice now. And to be quite honest, I'm a total loss to what actually happened. Um, I just think it was pretty down to just one of those days where absolutely nothing went right. I think that they outplayed us and I think they also outcoached us as well. We just didn't, didn't seem to get on the same page. But as I was saying earlier on, I, I've always been a big Tom Brady fan, uh, you know, even in his New England days. And the key thing to, with Tom Brady was he always had a good offensive line. 
in, in New England, always. And somebody got hurt. They used to have that saying, didn't they? Next man up. And usually their next men up were better than most people's uh, starting offensive line. Mm. Well, oh, we, we had our best player out and it just showed how fragile we are at that position. And uh, they were, I said before, you know, they, were, they, were, they were walking past Donovan Smith to get at him. You know. Well, I don't think we'll pin it, pin it all on Smith and Joe Haig just yet, but we'll, we'll come back and talk about the O. Gary, I'm almost, I'm almost scared to unbottle you. Um, tell us how you think it went. <laughs> Um, well, all I will say, Kieran, is get the bleep machine ready because you will need it. Um, I'll sum it up in this way. I got a text from a, from a mate uh, on uh, Tuesday morning. I was pretty tired having stayed up all night to watch the game. And I, my mate's a Steelers fan and he said, so what happened? How did it go? And my reply to him was that basically we couldn't pass, we couldn't run, we couldn't catch. We couldn't block. Uh, we couldn't punt. Apart from that, we were great. And and that isn't, 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 isn't the famous Bucks coaching quote, you know, something like, but we didn't, but we didn't coach either, so to make up for it or something, you know. Well, uh, if, um, if you read Pewter Report, there's, they've got a, a, a relatively new guy working for them called John Ledyard, and he wrote an article uh, probably on Tuesday morning. And he was basically accusing the, uh, the coaching staff of coaching malpractice. That's what he called it. And he was right. We were just out-coached, out-fought, out-played. We were bullied. It's as simple as that. To win a game mm. of football, you have to win the line of scrimmage. And, you know, we got, we got bullied by their defensive line and we got bullied, bullied by their offensive line. It was a shambles. It was embarrassing. Um, and the people that really need to take a long, hard look at themselves are Bruce Arians, Byron Lefwich, um, Todd Bowles, and particularly, and I'll, I'm looking forward to talking about special teams, the special teams guy, Keith Armstrong. So I have to preface all of this with, obviously, you know, we're Bucks fans. We will always be Bucks fans. We love this club. So you're just going to have to let us vent on this one. Matt, what was your take on it? Um, previously stated, you guys touched on a lot of, I guess, the frustrations I had. Um, I mean, it started obviously off, all phases, obviously were dominated. Um, as he just stated, the, the game's won in the trenches. Um, I love the word bullied. That's the perfect description mm. of it. We absolutely were manhandled, um, on both lines. And I mean, losing Ali Marpet is... It shouldn't ever be a reason like you just stated New England does it categorically up and down, you know, the decades that when somebody goes down, the person behind them should be good enough to be a replacement level player where you shouldn't have a steep drop off in your production. And I mean, I was I don't know what to say other than embarrassed by the lack of effort. Um, really, the thing that got to me, too, is the lack of emotion. Uh, we're so used to like in the Chicago game, seeing Brady cussing out his team for unnecessary penalties, which is how we all feel watching it. So it's so great to see that channeled through Brady and come out to yell at, you know, Ryan Jensen, for instance, where I'm like, I wanted to yell at him too. And I just didn't see that at all during any sideline shot, anybody on the field, just there was no emotion, just lifeless. Um, and that's what really hurts you the most. I think and gets to your heart is, you want them to care, and I just don't didn't see any anybody bothered by it. I'm used to seeing a pissed off bunch after a performance like that, and they just didn't seem angry. And I, that's the, I think what left me feeling so empty. Um, but yeah, I mean, our defense is really what bothered me. I mean, obviously they were on the field too much, but to have a belief that you can get pressure with your front four, not blitz and just sit back, have that fail for let alone four quarters, but even after one, and not change anything at all schematically. Yeah. I just, I'm baffled. What were you doing, Todd Bowles? What were you looking at that I'm... Oh, so there's some, there's some good stuff there. We'll come back to the defense, but I think the point you raised around Brady, I think is really interesting. None of us were in Brady's head, but, you know, I think he wasn't shouting because he knew he was just as, as much at fault as everyone else. And, you know, you're those that Agreed. cast the first stone and that sort of stuff. So let's, let's start talking about the, the offense. Maybe, Gary, we'll start off with you. Um, you know, the running game, you know, historically, you know, poor. The passing game wasn't clicking. We can talk about Antonio Brown. We can talk about who was and wasn't open and at what point Mike Evan cracks up the O-line. You know, you've got free range, Gary. Go for it. 
Um, well, the one thing I keep banging on about when I'm on here with uh, with the, the whole game, but particularly the offense, is some sort of creativity. And I got a bit of stick last time because people think what I mean by creativity is throwing flea flickers every every time or you know plays where you're tossing the ball from here to there to everywhere else I don't mean that what I mean is just change it just do something different don't run the little guy into the big guys up front every single time now they abandoned the run very very early they had to because we got so far behind but it is criminal that Mike Evans wasn't targeted in the first half when Jameis Winston got a lot of stick because he he targeted Mike Evans and seemed just to go to him when he shouldn't. Well, it was obvious that Brady was wanted to get Antonio Brown involved and he was looking for him at times when he shouldn't have been. As I say, not to involve Mike Evans in the first half at all is criminal. Um, so the headlines I've been reading, you know, imply, and I, I must I haven't watched the all-22s, but it implies that, you know, Mike Evans was being taken out of the game. And to take him out of the game, that must have mean at least double coverage, if not something more special. And as we've heard previously, someone else must have been open then. I mean, Matt, you look like you want to chip in there. I was going to say, I think sometimes people underappreciate what is Mr. Lattimore. I think people <laughs> underappreciate Mr. Lattimore. Um, as in, in the last three matchups against Mike Evans, he has a combined zero catches. And uh, to me, it's been different coaching, different quarterback, same result. At a point, that's on Mike Evans. you got to win your one-on-ones. And uh, even when they present themselves, I saw during the game, he didn't always win them. I think he's still hurt. And a lot of people also aren't appreciating that. Um, when I watch him right now, especially coming out of cuts in the, the top of his route, especially, uh, that's not the same Mike Evans burst that I'm used to seeing over years and years of watching his film. He's hurt. And you you, you add in as well a uh, Chris Godwin that's got some sort of weird device taped onto his hand, you know. And, I don't and even OJ's out. targeting that. Why are you even throwing it to a guy that has three fingers that are good when you have plenty of guys with 10 fingers that are good on the team? Just that, that baff, baffles me as well. Because you saw the one drop he had, and we know Chris Godwin never drops balls. I mean, that was the most catch. I, I would have caught that pass. And he just flat dropped it. And it's, I mean, what are you expecting with a robo finger? Phil, do you think we came away from the running game too early? Or or, or is it, you know, I have some sympathy with the other view that, we, you know, we were behind and, we, you know, our, our three yards are popping. We're lucky. Isn't going to cut it. Yeah, I, I, the <laughs> thing is, is that Brady's always needed a running game to, to, to actually uh, supplement his, his throwing. And just to abandon it quite so early was just, I just thought, you know, it must have been ways. But I, I did actually, I, go, I know what the O-line is one of my chief gripes. If they're not making holes for him to run through or not doing anything, then, then I can see why they abandoned it. But I go back to, to it again. You know, the O-line was, wasn't doing anything. It, it just it didn't present holes. It didn't give Brady the time. And... And yeah, I, I do tell you, I do agree with that he was trying to uh, target Antonio Brown. But you know, the other thing about Brady, what he used to do, was the short passes all the time. You know, to when he used to have his, his multiple tight end sets. Didn't I don't think I, I didn't see Bray, uh, Brait or Hudson or you know he was trying to get through to to Gronk, but only on long balls. But there wasn't that short pass all the time or or anything. It was just which was means just, you're in a three step. Uh, you know, definitely no three step drops. You're in a five step drop if yeah. you're lucky. Seven step drop. And as you say, he's hanging on, hanging on because whoever it is he's he's after isn't open. Yeah, and That's he's exactly never going to break the pocket anymore, is he? You know, it was like going back to, to twelve months ago when you know when Jameis was running for his life. You know, he's just the same as that. You know, I, it was very very frustrating. Very frustrating. I was more angered at the lack of, like I said, schematic changes where when that's mm. the type of environment that the game has become, I mean, at minimum, wouldn't you max protect, keep a tight end and, you know, and like you said, run the ball or, I mean, mm. even if you keep a tight end and run, put, put three receivers out there and I just, they did nothing. They just constantly ran the exact same offensive sets and let the entire left side get caved and Brady get under pressure and throw these wobbly, you know, low percentage throws over and over. Like nothing changed the entire game. Yeah. Just, okay. I don't think we tried an outside run. I don't think we tried a single slant. Nothing. Um, nothing. 
we had, I think was, we had one screenplay that got sniffed out or something, didn't we? You know. Yeah, mm. at the top, top of the hash. Right. Mm. Do you know, I will say one thing. I think I said on an earlier podcast, I think when you said, what was your magic wand? And that was for us to play in all four quarters. What we were doing in, in games previously, we were playing for three quarters and, and like, say, in the first quarter, it took us the first quarter to wake up. Trouble is, by the time we woke up, we were 21 nil down. And, you know, they went, they went to a, a, a game that just didn't seem right at all. But, yeah, I think that's a very good point. We, we should have changed something on the field. You know, we, we had all these plaudits in previous weeks. And it just looked like we got game plan A and there wasn't a plan B. Agreed. Ooh, and we weren't the... really cycling through the personnel either. It just seems like the backfield is Rojo and Fournette and anyone else get lost. Mm, well, Keisha yeah. on Vaughan wasn't even active. Mm. You know, your third round draft pick, and, and are we giving up on him? I mean, he when he's been in, I know he's only been in, in the garbage time, but he's done well. Mm. He's been very productive. Yeah. But don't you so think he's was... been active? Hmm. In, pre- in previous weeks as well, it just seems that if you know if a running back makes a mistake, Arians takes him out straight away, and you don't see him for a quarter, a quarter, and a bit. I just and yet, quite... look, um, Jared Cook, the tight end, drop a uh, fumble, didn't he, on the one or the two? Mm. Um, if that had been Arians, you wouldn't have seen Jared Cook again for the no. rest of but he was straight back in there and he caught a couple more balls. It's I, we were just mm. out coached. And Matt's point about not changing anything is absolutely bang on. And, and it's even more, uh, it's worse than that, to, you know, when we talk about the defence. Well, you, before we get to the defence, you mentioned getting down to the two. And the must be, my, I know I should be impartial, but my, my, the thing that made my blood boil in this whole game was when we were down on the goal line and we could not punch that ball in because we were running off tackle over Donovan Smith and Joe Haig when you got Jensen, Capra, and Wirfs on the other side. Mm. Why do you have Leonard Fournette on your team if you're not going to give him one attempt minimum there? Mm. That's what we brought him for. And and that's where Gronk has made his money. Gronk is not this flashy, dashy, down-the-field guy. He's down the seam where you're not covering him. And he's on the goal line, you know, hooking out and, and doing some little sneaky stuff where you, where it's about quickness rather than pace. And we just didn't have any of that in there, did we? Yeah, again, it's creativity, isn't it? Creativity on play calling. We do the same thing time after time. Uh, you know, the, the two passes, uh, I don't even know what you call it. One the, the, on the fourth down was to Mike Evans, but on the third down, I think it was, was exactly the same throw on the other side of the field. It's, it's this, oh, I'm just, there is a theme <laughs> I know. coming out. And I mean, I know what you feel. I maybe be, hours yeah. after the game. It Maybe was... beauty's in the eye of the beholder because I'm just kind of you watch red zone, don't you? Bouncing around the league, and you just see all these other teams that are down at the one that do this little dinky little move or roll out or pass where you know to, to some guy that's got half the end zone to themselves, mm-hmm. you know. And we just never have that. We never do. Our do credit. Two years ago, we uh, we played Seattle with Mike Glennon at quarterback, and we went about 24 nil up, something like that. There was a, a goal line play in that game that it was Mike James, the running back, who took it and just dinked it over the top of the, the defensive line to the tight end, I think it was, Crabtree. Yeah. You know, creativity, that's what I'm going on about. If the team, if the opposition is expecting you to do the same thing time after time, do something different. So, defence. Wins championships, allegedly. Um, you know, I kind of, again, the game, the game got away from us. I think we can have lots of sympathy. Um, it felt like a game that we just, um, we didn't, you know, the scheme wasn't right. Was that, a, what do you reckon, Gary? Uh, the scheme wasn't right. And as Matt touched on earlier, as soon as it became obvious that the scheme wasn't right, we didn't change it. I mean, we've, we've talked on this podcast before about how many times we blitz. We barely blitzed uh, Drew Brees. You've got the guy who is... If he's not the, he's certainly one of the most accurate quarterbacks ever to play the game. And he's got so much time that he can just wait and dink it five yards, 10 yards, three yards, whatever. Uh, and he was carving us up. And the, the one thing that, that totally baffles me about our defence, and this isn't just that this game, this has been since the year dot, 
Why do we let the opposing receivers catch the ball? Why are they stood on their own and they catch the ball? Where, why, why aren't our secondary on top of them, alongside them, with their arms draped around them, not fouling them, but you know, trying to prevent them catching the ball? That first touchdown was a case in point. I mean, I was sitting on my sofa in Northamptonshire in, in the UK, and I was closer to that receiver than our nearest <laughs> defensive back. <laughs> well, it's just ludicrous. You know, so, so you're talking about that sort of that, that sort of zone look that we have, where we're sort of almost playing prevent, like way early on in the game. It felt you... like we were trying to do. I think our game plan, Matt, and just see if you agree with me. Our game plan was we thought that Breeze was going to try and dink it and dunk it, and we were going to try and do bend but don't break and let them have three yards at a time, and eventually they'd make a mistake. But instead, they were going downfield. Um, is that right? I mean, I think our, I don't know, our recipe to success on defense, at least with the current roster composition we have and their athletic profiles, et cetera, is our secondary is built to be athletic ball hawks. They're not a quick twitch secondary that's built to be in coverage for eight seconds at a time and, and run like, you know, chickens with their heads cut off all over the field. That's not, that's not who they are. As part of that, they all too often in that game got stuck in that mode, which obviously that's what pressure counters. And once it became apparent that our four man rush wasn't getting home, you can't continue to leave guys out there to do what they're the worst at, which is to run around the field for eight seconds. The, the saints receivers are all besides Michael Thomas, small, short, jittery guys that you're just, you're asking the world of a defense to do that. So it's their fault. Yes. But at the same token, that's also, I mean, completely on the shoulders of Todd Bowles. Like you, you just have to accept you're not, you know, succeeding at what you're doing and do something different, anything. I mean, if we're rushing for that, means we've got seven back in coverage. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you've, you've touched on this, Gary. Breeze is, as well as being accurate, he's just clever. He's not, you know, he's just going to look around the field and work out who's going to be open. Uh, and because he's played against us so often, he knows who's going to be open because he knows mm. the scheme that we're playing. You know, it's it's we didn't change anything. That's the point for me. You've got to do something to change it up. And we did nothing. We just sat with the same scheme, sending the same four and dropping the rest in coverage, but allowing their receivers to catch the ball. We should be playing man. We should be stopping them. We, we've got... You know, the, you can manhandle them effectively within the first five yards, can't you? Why don't we do that? Why don't we try and throw the timing of the, of the play off? Give the, give the pass rush time to get there. What really surprised me, too, was the lack of pressure, too, from our secondary. If you look at, like, the last three weeks, um, that's what I've personally just myself fallen in love with with our defense is watching Antoine Winfield Jr. blossom into that, you know, almost – a better, I think, I don't know if this is the best comp, but uh, Tyron Matthew, Honey Badger, where he plays kind of that hybrid role. And they really do bring him up to the LOS often, right up to the line of scrimmage and put him in, you know, pressure situations or even man up on a tight end. And I, I mean, I, I think I saw Winfield in the line of scrimmage twice the entire night. I just don't understand that when you have such an athletic player, that's a complete mismatch and a nightmare on deep, on offense to schematically, you know, go against on your defense, why you're not blitzing that guy off the edge. I mean, if you're not getting anything out of your front four, you've got to blitz him. And then and it almost becomes that anybody. third, it almost becomes that third linebacker when we're in nickel. Agreed. Yeah. Cause we were and... blitzing our linebackers throughout <laughs> the game. I mean, that did happen, but at the same token, you know, that's not always guaranteed to succeed where you're going to really start to baffle them and, and get them to have to have some miscommunications or really be good professional football players is blitzing your secondary, you know, and, and we just didn't do any of that at all. Now, like you said, creativity, just nothing on both sides of the ball was creative whatsoever. It was all stale and we were robotic and like, you know, you, you can't do that against any coach, let alone Sean Payton. I think Adam said it last week is that, you know, I really hope we, um, someone man marks, you know, takes out Kamara on every play. And I felt like that should have been Winfield's job. Yep. Well, they actually, if, if they looked at the last couple of games, that's, that's what they've actually made Devin White's job is mm. he has himself wiped out McCaffrey, Kamara. If you go look actually at every running back he's gone against, he wiped, that's why PFF loves him and rates him so highly. He just eliminates that player. And he, I mean, start, he started with last week against the Giants too. I was very unimpressed with Devin White's coverage in space last week and this week. Not at all the same guy I've watched on film all year leading up to the last two games. So I'm going to chalk it up as a bad couple games and 
and be uh, optimistic that that won't happen again because he's way too talented of a football player to look like that on film. The first touchdown, I, I, I've watched it twice now, and the first touchdown, it just they were all looking at each other in the secondary thinking, well, how did that happen? You know, the, the coverage was far too soft. Um, that was so obvious on the first touchdown, but we, why didn't they change it? Yeah, just, S- SMB was pointing it. back because I think they they faked some sort of wide receiver screen or yeah. rocket screen or something, and then dunked it over the top. Yeah, after finding something positive, I'm I'm really struggling with that one. But I have to admit though, you did start to, when when they got to uh, they got to Breeze, then obviously he he did what uh, he Breeze does, getting Breeze's face, and and he he panics. Thought so I just got the feeling though through the whole game we showed him far too much respect. You know, we didn't get at him. We all sort of you know, sort of that's to cover his weapons and and as Matt said earlier on you know the offense was on the field so little they must have been out on the knees by the fourth quarter and they were bringing everybody in when they you know we'll bring taste mill for a play and they were bringing players in I never even heard of I think it was some I think they dragged a couple of people out of the stand to have a go yeah it, that it, tied in I think he was the beer guy from section 148 he is yes yes <laughs> Yeah, and I just don't. I just they they totally outcoached us, totally and utterly. So um, I say I've watched it twice. I've tried to make some notes. And I just thought we'll do that line drawn one of those games. Let's forget about it. Let's move on. You know, and, and that's about all I can say. But I have to admit, you know, some of these, some of what happened on Sunday, the warnings have been there in previous games. You know, and as I said we haven't played well for you know not all four quarters against the Giants. You know, we we struggled a bit. We won, but we struggled a bit. And we, do you remember saying at the, on the last week, "Well, a win's a win." Well, we got caught out Sunday. We got caught out big style. I, uh, Gary, are there I any... to find a couple crumbs. I would like to give at least my shining star if there was any that night. Um, once again, to Shaquille Barrett. I mean, he was the only guy I saw out there that I, like I was talking about earlier, if I, if I'm, and I played football when I'm on a team that's getting literally beaten that badly, where it's just demoralizing and you want to go home, you look around your, you know, yeah. current roster and your sideline really, and just see who has heart, who's still out there showing that they care, even when the game's over. And he was the only guy I saw out there giving max effort. I mean, he had a strip sack. He just, I felt like every snap of that second half when the game was completely out of reach, he was giving maximum effort. And so as a, as a fan and somebody that really loves the sport and my hat's off to that, which I'd love to see. The, the other thing I noticed was Levante David as well. He was coming to the line of Scrooge and he was pointing here and pointing he there. Was, and you're was, right. He, he was so confused that they talked about it on the telecast too, as in not that it was his fault, but confused as in, he didn't understand what his fellow teammates were doing as in he thought the coverage was one thing. He's like, why, why aren't, and you could see him yelling yeah. at people right before the snap. And then he was right. What he was yelling at was where they scored. Mm. So but you're it's right. interesting. He was, that, he was engaged. Yeah. It's interesting that David's taking charge in that way. Cause I love it. It, it, yeah, even more surprisingly, it's obviously so when Devin white came along, Devin white was given the play calling responsibilities. He was the one meant to be pointing the finger, which I thought was surprising at the time. I'm personally starting to get worried about the, I mean, I'm just going to call it for what it is, severe regression in SMB's play over the last five games. Um, It started in Oakland. Um, It's been, well, Green Bay really, but anyway, it's been downhill. Uh, He has just looked lost. And the other thing, they're they're picking on Jamal Dean a bit as well, aren't they? I noticed that as well during the game. It's it's surprising to me because he just, He's such a frustrating uh, player to predict because he puts up film one week where he, I mean, I call it jump out of the gym athleticism. He's one of the profiles. I think one of the best cornerbacks in the entire NFL. And then the next week I look like a moron and I wonder how he's even on a pro roster. It's so up and down, but if he, he has it in him, if he could just find the consistency, that kid has all the talent in his body to be one of the best there is. And obviously with Carlton Davis, we're asking him usually to cover the best guy on the field as well. So he's a, he's usually got the hardest job. He's a consummate professional already, in my opinion. He just goes out and does his job. He gets a lot of PI, but that's who he is, and that's who we drafted. A physical guy that that's who you need to get in Michael Thomas's big mouth face. Mm. But they just they were just looking at each other, completely gone out, as if saying, "Well, is it, it wasn't he yours, or was it?" Yeah, I just I just yeah. Didn't but, get it. But the bewilderment point, everywhere. The point on that though, Phil. And Arians, Arians made the same point in his press conference. He said about uh, the communication. There was a problem with the communication. This is 
we're halfway through the second year of this defense with the same players. So mm. all the players on the defense, with the exception of Winfield, I think, were here last year. They played 16 games last year, nine games now this year, and we're still getting communication errors. We're still getting problems where people are lining up wrong or you know don't know what, what the guy over here is doing. It, what the heck is going on? What are the coaching staff doing? Well, I think you have to give the Saints some credit. They're a damn good team. They certainly yeah. showed it in the two good times they played us because they're well coached. And I think they're well schemed. So we were all coming out expecting to try and have to gang tackle Kamara and defend these little dippy dippy passes from someone that allegedly can't throw it downfield anymore, which I've said myself. But actually the ball was in the air and they weren't they weren't doing little passes and they managed to keep other running backs Mm -hmm. busy as well. The the other point to make here and that hasn't been made yet, we're six and three. We'd have absolutely ripped your arm off last year for six and three. I think 100%. nine games ago you would have done. You'd have very happily taken six and three. Yeah, I, I agree. Press the reset button. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Well, before we can reset, we do have to talk about special teams, which, as you'll know, is a, is a favourite topic of mine. Uh, Matt, maybe if you start us off, um, special teams it seems to start slow and get a bit better. Do you think? One thing quickly about the defense as well that gives us a little glimmer of hope um, I want people to keep in mind is you got to think like when you go look at last week, how the Chicago Bears played the Saints. Um, If you don't think we're better than the Chicago Bears, you didn't watch the football game. And to see how they played them and then see how we played the Saints literally the following weekend. I mean, it's very, very possible that in the world of football, you just don't show up some weeks. And I agree with everyone here. I mean, I, I think just, Everybody losing their heads over Brady's a bust. This is all done. We're, it's, it's over. At some point, too, maybe we purposely were just trying to get that NFC East winner in Wild Card Weekend to give us a little, you know, get going of confidence because we're going to get a, a really simple game to play, I think, in the Wild Card Weekend. You never know. <laughs> okay, so what about special teams, though? Um, yeah, as far as special teams go, um, I've personally been very, very uh, optimistic all year, and actually, I think – proven correct that we have a kicker um he i mean ryan goes out there every single game and just does his job and that's all you can ask for and he, and he makes it look easy i don't i've never really seen too many of these field goals where they hit a post and go in or anything like that he just does his job so that's great and then mr pinion bradley coming into this week um i had no worries at all and i just don't know what he was doing as far as um locating punts kicking the ball period i mean that very first punt i want to say because they returned it to our 35 yard line, but I think in air distance, I went, went 27 yards. Um, I think that the saints beer guy that they brought in to play tight end, he could have punted it further than that. <laughs> so that just blows yeah, me away. Yeah. I don't understand. Oh, it. Ga- Gary, been... my spider senses are telling me you're all, all over these punts. Yeah, he's, he's been great this year. I mean, I really can't critique Bradley Pinion up until this week. He really mm. has done a quite, quite a good job. And I just, like I said, it was a com- complete team, total collapse. Every phase played terribly we couldn't cover kicks our gunners were out of place um i mean i just i have no answer for it other than just everybody failed as a team bad bad game gary go on give us your take on the punters Uh, on the punting um well yeah he was pretty bad but there was a bit of a wind wasn't there and and, yeah that's true he um he was punting so much he's probably his leg was tired come the end of the game so no. Yeah, Not a but, but if you're punting into the wind again, and it's, this is the coach's hey. job, are you going for hang time? No, are you trying to get it out on the sideline on the pooch? Yes, the thing for me on special teams, um, a few weeks ago, my um magic wand was get a return game, and I, I want you to indulge me now because I have a little bit of a theory. I, can I just get a straw poll from the three of you? When Jaden Mickens catches the ball on, let's say, the one-yard line, so he's got to bring it out, which direction does he run, Kieran? Left. Phil? It's left, yeah. Mm. Matt? I can't disagree. It's left or straight. <laughs> it's left it's ever or... to where the blocking alley is, ever. Mm. It, right. Right. He's allergic of... to going to where it's supposed to go. 
<laughs> I did a bit of an exercise today. I went on YouTube and had a look at some kickoff returns. You know, the, last year, uh, 2019, there was 14 kickoff returns for touchdowns. Four of them, they ran up the middle. Ten of them, they ran down the sideline. Now, that tells me that if you go down the sideline, you've got more of a chance. If you watch Jaden Mickens, he runs straight down the middle where the blockers are. There's so many examples on YouTube. Um, the very first kickoff for a return for a touchdown this year was uh, by the Ravens at KC. He went straight down the sideline. He didn't run up the middle, but we're coaching our guy to run straight down the middle. Um, I had a look at Devin, Devin Hester's. You know, he did 14 kickoffs uh, for return touchdowns. 10 of them he ran down the sideline. That tells me that we're coaching to run. Comments. Or, or we can't block. It's, I think it's cool to see the analytics brought into it that you just proposed. I had no idea. I just remember even as a kid from Pop Warner to junior to high school. Um, I mean, that's how I was because I was always, you know, the shorter, smaller, faster kids. So those are the positions I played. And I was always taught your instant step is always forward. You want to obviously channel and draw everybody into kind of a bunch and then you break it outside and that's where you let your speed take over. And like you just touched on, that's how every great returner from, you know, Devin Hester to Dante Hall to everyone else, that's how they do it. They start up the field, channel everybody in and then they juke outside mm -hmm. and that's and where then, speed takes over. And we don't and ever then, do that, ever. We never do it. We never, ever do it. You've, if, or you've just got to say, go on YouTube. Anybody who's watching this now, if you don't believe me, Go on YouTube for any request in for any kickoff returns. And I guarantee you the majority of yeah. them are running, they're heading for the sideline as soon as they set off. If they see a seam, yeah, fair enough, they'll go for it. Devin Hester did it in the Super Bowl against um, the opening kickoff against the, the Colt. Colt. Yeah. yeah. You have a look. It's on YouTube. He went straight down the sideline. Keith Armstrong, what do we coach our guys to do? straight down the middle coaching again i'm sorry we've got the biggest coaching staff in the nfl and uh, you know do we have anybody who knows what they're doing after the example of this game i'm not sure we do so i think that holds your kick returns and on punt returns i think mickens has got really good hands he's really impressed me so far this year he's grabbing everything um but, you're, but then but then i think he's got no blocking in front of him no, I think I think you're right. The problem with with punt returns is you catch it and they're right on you, so you fair catch it, and then obviously you can't bring it out anyway. They're not getting any time because the the other punters are, uh, you know, they're going for hang time. The girls are getting down there, so it's it's actually fairly rare in the NFL anyway to see a punt return. But kickoff returns, no. I mean, look at Patterson for the Bears. He brought every single one out. And just about every time, go back and watch it. He took, he headed for the sideline. What I think frustrates me as far as also, this is just, you know, I don't know if you call it strategy or just simple, you know, fundamentals of football. But on our punt returns, same exact thing. Um, when you watch like the Saints return punts, and, and he's not wrong that the propensity to return a punt for a touchdown versus a kickoff, it's a large, large margin. But you should still be able to flip the field and get a, a little bit of positive yardage. And what frustrates me is more so on a punt return than a kick return. It's completely on the returner to set up the blocks. And he offers nothing in that category. He just takes the ball and runs forward. He never, I mean, the good punt returners, like, um, I want to say his name Zach Pascal that returns punts for the Indianapolis Colts. Randomly, I was watching that game. Um, he is very, very good, has an innate ability of understanding as soon as you catch that ball, it's all on your first step and how you take it that that first guy's hips are going to open and you can set him up for failure instantly and you make him miss. Then you do it again. And you break your shoulder down to the right. That next guy, that gunner coming down, he's going to miss. And you can then set it up to where your blocker is going to catch up to him. It's, you know, that's the biggest part of returning. It's not so much the athletic profile of the player. It's you got to set it up for yourself to succeed. And we just don't have anybody back there that's capable of getting themselves extra yards because they just are a robot. Catch the yeah. ball, run forward and get tackled. I think that's right. You don't maybe have maybe to... we're okay with that. Maybe yeah. Bruce told him because we don't fumble a lot on special teams maybe he tells them to do that i don't know i mean it could be i think you're right that is the recipe for 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 magic 
But, you know, if we just want to be average, you've just got to make the first guy miss. Touche. Um, and, then you, and you hope that actually someone, someone's being blocked. And then, and then that's both gunners. And then, like you say, then the field opens up. Did Phil, you... let's get your view on special teams. Well, yeah, I, th I think after week one, I was just happy to see that uh, somebody actually caught it and didn't run into <laughs> each other and all things like that. So let's get on well, building blocks here. But yeah, you were right. I, I never thought of it went until Gary said. I will say about Pinion, though, you know, I've got a, bit, a little bit of sympathy for him. I watched him today because I knew, because I know he's our host, you know, D minus and all that. But I just, I just sort of watched him a bit today. He, I tell you what, he was doing well to get the ball away. I don't know anything else. They were on top of him before, he, you know, there was one or two that they were so close to get, get you know, knocking it away. So, you know, I've got a bit of sympathy with Pinion. Yeah, He's and that roughing the, the kicker time. wasn't a roughing the kicker. It's because the Saints had a heads-up play and they blocked our guy into the kicker. That's legal yep. and it's mm. stupid if you let it happen. Yeah, exactly. Indeed. So, you know, yeah. So, i got a bit of sympathy with him on, on that one, you know. No doubt you won't have. <laughs> uh, I've said my piece. That's it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing grades anymore. Uh, the hate mail starting to come in. So, uh, <laughs> so now we now we move into our um, our magician's realm, where you have your magic wand and you can be Bruce Aarons and you can fix one thing this week. And I think we agree that even after we've all used our magic wand, there's probably still going to be something left. Um, Gary, we can maybe come to you and then over to Matt. So you've got your magic wand. Where are you going to work it? Um, well, my initial thought was to put us in a time machine and take us back to our time, 20 past 1 a.m. on uh, the early hours of Tuesday morning, and let's try again, because it can't be any worse than it was. Um, but I think, more realistically, I think what I would like is um, to open the filing cabinet that has got plan B on it, and hopefully the filing cabinet next to that has got plan C on it. So I'd like to, uh, with my magic wand, unlock that filing cabinet that says plan B. Okay, I like that. So we've got plan B coming out of the filing cabinet. Matt, if you're a magician, how are you going to work your magic? I think we just need to get back to basics. Understanding what we do best and what we don't do best and playing that way. We've schematically never have we ever, at least in my years of seeing Todd Bowles as our DC, have we just sat back in a, you know, front four pressure only and watched. So um, starting there, let's just, you know, work on some pressure packages, even some stunts. Because the one play we did do a stunt, we got a strip sack from Shaq. Um, you know, just not so bland. So let's get out of the bland and get back to the bold. And then on offense, um, I think the exact same thing uh, he touched on it earlier, which kind of got my my brain going a little bit, is I do kind of now agree with that assessment as I thought about it, that we were really, really forcing it and trying to make sure we got Antonio Brown involved in the offense and the continuity going. And maybe Bruce looked at it as, hey, you know, it's it's a gamble, but if we lose this game because of it, who cares? It's a regular season game where we have a 93% chance of making the playoffs, even with the loss at six and three. And he really wanted to make sure we got that going so that we're better in, you know, January. But um, yeah, I just say we'd start there and make sure that we're not force feeding our offense to one player and on defense, let's get a little more creative. Brilliant. And that sounds like the worst drinking game ever, by the way. Never have I ever seen the Bucks <laughs> not get to the quarterback. You're going to be on, well, you need a stomach pump. Yes, agreed. <laughs> agreed. Phil, yeah. Phil, if you're, if you're going to be uh, coach Arians, where is your focus? I think I've, I've wrote down some notes before and both, both Gary and Matt just said exactly what I've written down here. Get back, get back to Watch the games where we did well at like the Packers game because that was only two games ago, and let's just see what we did right. Let's, get, let's, let's just put it down to one of those games and let's just start it all over again. But I will say one thing: uh, no injuries. We've had no injuries this week. To speak no serious injuries. So let's con so try and give them something different. Let's just um, let's just, just have no injuries. Get back to basics and do what Gary said. Let's just have a look again. I think that's that's a really good point. And so for my magic one, I'm going to be a little bit provocative, and I'd I'd love to hear your reaction to this because I was my original magic one thing was going to be can we go and take the playbook please from um, either the Broncos or the Titans or someone that manages to do a nice balanced but modern offense. And then I thought actually. You know, actually, my magic wand is going to be I'm going to transform Byron Leftwich into an offensive coordinator. And I thought, am I overreacting? Because we are 
a winning team and we've scored more points than we've ever done and we've scored almost as many points as anyone in the NFL going into to, to the game. But, you know, and, and I don't want to be, you know, I, I feel like, you know, you know, young coaches, he's clearly got promise, he's clearly got potential, a bit like Raheem Morris and not just the colour thing, but the fact they were throwing him perhaps a little bit too young. And Raheem Morris clearly has blossomed while he's been at the Falcons and, you know, he's going to be a strong contender now. And I wonder if maybe Leftwich is a little bit too soon. Um, what do you think? I, I honestly think <laughs> we've, we've, we've spent a lot of money on bringing probably the greatest player of all time into our into our system, and he just go back and watch Anthony just for New England. Give him, give the man time; he'll pick any team apart. You've got to do; he's got to do something with with this O line. You know, we've spent a lot of money. We're getting all these Antonio Browns come in, Gronks come in, but last year we all sat there and said this O line is is woeful. It's all over the place, and we're watch watching that game you know, about Gary and his time machine it took me back 12 months watching James running for his life and the O-line totally and utterly ineffective I don't want to pick one player out because I'm, I'm getting a bit tired of talking about this man but, but you know it, they were just walking past him you know it, it was if you watch I, I, I watched Pinion do a lot of punting I also watched Donovan Smith on the, on the plays and they were, he just they just didn't know what he was all over the place Give Brady time, he'll fix it for us. End of. Agreed. He's the okay. greatest player. He is the greatest player of all time. If, um, we've got him, and he's and he's showing the form like he, you know, in, that he has in past years. He's a winner. He wants to win. You know, th- this Super Bowl ring. If if we ever get the Super Bowl and win it, and you know, I've got a fully feeling that the Saints are going to get paid back for that. I really have. But. Um, I get, I get the feeling it's going to be his, his most important one. He wants to win that and win it badly. Yep. I mean, hell, he's all about buying a house down in town, Prince. So, you know, he's... The um, um, question is, Phil, are we going to win it with Byron Lefwich as the play caller, as the coordinator? Well, if I'd asked you that against the Packers, what would you have said? You know, I the, the, would have said absolutely yes, but, you know, has, yeah. he, has he peaked too soon? Has he shown his true colours in this game? Well, it's like you said earlier on. We're six and three. We we would have we would have ripped your arm off for that. You know, if we carry on, we're, we're probably going to make the playoffs for the first time since uh, is it two thousand and four or something. Um, two thousand seven, yeah. Two thousand seven. Oh, I was at the game as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and two thousand and seven, and um, you know, it's. Uh, I just think I I literally I put it down to one of those games. But go back. Go back to the basics, go back to the drawing board, let's look at the film, see, see what, we can put, what we can put right, and let's go again next week. And the thing okay. to do with the film, Phil, is to burn it. No, I right. don't agree. I think it's watch it once, twice, three times. What did we do wrong? And the coaches have got, got, to, got to hold the hand up and say, you know, you know, I actually watched the game and then watched Nightmare on Elm Street for a bit of light relief after that one. <laughs> and it was... I just think they've, 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 got to, they've got to hold their hands up and say, look, you know, we made a complete mess of it. What are we going to do to put it right? OK, well, we, I know you've drawn your line under it, Phil, but first of all, we're going to hear what our members thought. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> so our members gave us their opinions as well, and we'll start off with Gary Woolard. Not many Bucks defeats over the years stick in the throat quite as much as last night's. I think it's because we all know how much talent we have on this team at present. I think that's true. That, that is probably why it hurts quite as bad as it does. Uh, okay. Then we have Richard Balchin. Uh, why soft zone coverage with David and Dean being big man coverage guys and with Breeze having lowest average attended air yards? Byron's play calling, no rhythm or flow. <clears throat> Worth the stud even against Cam Jordan. Hopefully a wake up call. I feel sorry for the Panthers the Panthers, because we'll light them up next week. I like the, the, the bounce back mentality. And from uh, Woolley, uh, well that was painful. Sadly not the worst Bucks performance we've seen. No, it did bring back shades of uh, Atlanta in 14 and 11, didn't it? Um, not the worst Bucks performance we've seen, but something that we would hopefully not be seeing this year. But worst of all, Winston with his eat a W all over the place today. I hope his next bowel movement is a hedgehog. 
Um, <laughs> I think we'd all cut Winston some slack right up until now, but um, tough, tough call. Uh, and then lastly, Steve Gargit, I'm going to promise I'll get your name right for once. Hope it's just an aberration on our part, albeit we are flattered to deceive in some games this year. A week is a long time in football. Let's hope it's long enough for the coaches to get this sorted. The Panthers had a much improved performance last night. So someone thinks we're going to walk it. Someone thinks it's going to be tight. We'll come on to talk about that. One of As usual, our thanks go to Bucks Report for helping to promote us. <laughs> and this week we have uh, a first of the club giveaways where you had a chance to win your own Bucks UK merchandise. We had a beanie hat you could win because winter's drawing in. <clears throat> and we also had a brand new uh, Bucks UK members patch. Um, money can't buy these at the moment. You have to renew for 2021 and then you'll get your patch. Um, so those were up for, up for grabs and we had lots of entries. That's really cool. So we have lots of entries <clears throat> and we will see who is going to be going home with a beanie, who is going to be going home with a patch. Before I spin, don't feel upset if it's not you because it's the same competition again this week. Get on the forum, members only, sign up on the competition thread and with, you could be on the wheel next week. But for, for now, let's see who's going home with the beanie and the patch. There aren't many Woolards this week either. We'll see who it's going to be. Oh, just into Stuart. Congratulations, Stuart. Stuart, you are a winner. <laughs> and Stuart, you will have a warm head throughout winter and a nice patch on your arm to show for it. <laughs> cliche phrase is there but it's as true as ever we are on to Carolina and I think we'll work out what we think our keys to the game are how we're going to get through this who are the players to watch on both sides of the ball maybe Phil if we start with you um, your key to the game what, what's going to be the difference maker in this one um, I saw I read I read this week that somebody every time Brady's had a, a, a big really unexpected loss he's bounced back the following week and i think key to the key to the game our game is we've got more pep back we've got our own line strong again and we like we say we get back get back to base we've got to get back to where where we were before before last sunday um but the thing that concerns me about this is the panthers you can they remember parallel with us they're a new quarterback a lot of new players and and they took time to get going but I watched them a bit this week, and yeah, they've got going a bit this week. They've got, they've got to stop uh, Bridgewater from running around, and um, they've got to get to him a bit because he's got some feral weapons out in the, you know, his, his receiving core. So it, I, my key to the game was get a, you've got to, got to get a Bridgewater and get him early and stop him from running around because he can cause you all sorts of problems. Okay, so controlling Bridgewater is a, is one key, and I guess also then a player to watch out for. Gary, well, who do you think your what do you think is going to come down to? Um, well, um, I, on my notes here, the top one is stop McCaffrey. Well, it looks like that might not need to happen, um, but then equally we stopped Kamara, and that didn't stop the Saints rolling all over us. So uh, my second note is pressure Bridgewater. So Phil's pinched that one as well. Um, so I think probably the, uh, the the guy we've got to stop is whoever takes over from McCaffrey. And that'll be this uh, Mike Davis. He's he he did fill in pretty solidly for him when he when McCaffrey was out with his ankle. So I think probably the key to the game is stop Davis and pressure Bridgewater. So stop that running game, come back to the buck strength, which is stopping the running game, making other teams one-dimensional. Just like just like to say here, Gary, that one, one player that, that's really impressed me this year, he, he impressed me was he was with the Jets. He was a good wide receiver. And when they went to the Panthers, you know, he gave, he's given them a, a you know, double-edged threat with more as Robbie Anderson. 
They're using him a lot. He's scoring a lot. He's, he's scoring a few, and he's really been really blossomed into the receivers. He, well, he was at New York, you know. But um, you've got to watch him. He's he's a, he's a he's a big danger. He's, he's and he's also becoming Bridgewater's go-to guy as well. I think the one area that I haven't heard anybody touch on yet that personally, I guess, is my area of concern is um, there's no disputing that we struggle to cover tight ends in the red zone. And I want to say his name is Ian Thomas, I believe, the Panthers tight end. Um, He's, I want to say, six foot seven, uh, easily goes 250 or more, just a large specimen of a man. And that's one area that I really hope we improve, I guess, this week is our you know, tight end coverage in the red zone. It's been very, very poor this year. Granted, Cook fumbled on the goal line, but if you look at that from another perspective, he was also one missed tackle away from scoring another touchdown from a tight end right there. So if Ian Thomas is the giant, I mean, often in that yes. scenario, you, it would be Winfield's guy, wouldn't it, probably? And I think it'd actually be Jamel Dean. Okay, yeah. They, they've, they've, put, they've seemed to at least put lately Dean, which is the right matchup. He's mm, the guy mm. that... Um, like I said, he can get up there with anybody at the, you know, point highest point of the ball. Um, so that's that's going to be the one matchup that, to me, I think will dictate a lot of their success. Because I think, like you guys touched on, we stopped the run such an elite level that even Mike Davis, I mean, hats off to him, by the way. He's done a very phenomenal job filling in the shoes that are as large as Christian McCaffrey's would be to fill. Um, he's done a great, great job. But uh, that's what we do best. And. Um, I just, yeah, I'm really worried about the tight end, if anything, because I think our cornerbacks are good enough to stop Anderson and Moore. And, and you guys all touched on it too. DJ Moore is really, I think, blossomed, and so is Robbie Anderson under Bridgewater. Bridgewater's just a great quarterback, man. Brings his lunch pail to work, doesn't complain, and does his job. Mm. Excellent. I think on the other side of the ball, my key to the game is probably going to be about protecting Brady. Um, you know, I don't think this, is, this isn't an elite-level pass rush the Panthers have got, but they're definitely above average. And they've shown the last few weeks as part of their resurgence, I think, has been putting pressure on other quarterbacks. Um, so I don't think it's going to be an easy ride for Brady. So that would be my key to the game. In terms of any other players, then, that you want to have an eye on, we've talked, I think we've covered most of them, Bridgewater, McCaffrey, DJ Moore, you've mentioned, uh, Ian Thomas. Are there any other players that you think we need to, to be aware of? I say you got Curtis Samuel, who's always, you know, he's their go-to guy. He's always, you know, he's always the guy who just, you know, you're not expecting to score one. He's, you know, he's quite, he's, he's quite handy. But you know, we we've got the players to cover to cover these. I'm, I'm more, to be quite honest, I'm more concerned with the bad cells than I am about them. To be quite honest. Can we press the reset button? Can we actually put it all right? And you know, so I think you know, because it's the like I say. Can we protect Brady? Is Ali Morpet okay? And et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't think there'll, there'll be a problem if we can sort of reset, you know, re- press the reset button. Go on, Matt. If I want to put a, a, a random spotlight on a player, I want to see more out of Mr. Steve McClendon, our new acquisition from the New York Jets. He uh, played well against Oakland in his limited snaps and then – I just think that against the Giants, he was up and down. This week, he was our weakest link, in my opinion, on that defensive line. And he had a couple back-to-back, actually, um, encroachment penalties that we had three of them in a row. I've never seen that in my life. Yeah, I think. And again, the player I'd highlight, probably similar similar reasoning, I'd highlight JPP. It feels like he was really pumped up for the Giants game. And then maybe just the adrenaline bank was a little bit empty last week. I'm not yeah, gonna, that's saying why. he wasn't trying, but uh, but you, know, you you highlighted Matt the energy that Shaq Barrett had, and I kind of feel like if we get that energy on both sides of the ball, then that that yeah, means you're gonna like, have agreed. Good stuff. So then we <laughs> have, have to have that um, juice in order to get it. You know, it's that's the problem sometimes is if your team comes out flat, it kind of wears on everybody and. And, and to me, that's why I was kind of highlighting it. To me, it's all on Tom. You are as your quarterback goes. And when he's out there lifeless with no emotion, the rest of the team doesn't really like feed off of it and kind of is lackadaisical and goes, you know, with complacency and just in the motions. And that's the result you get. I think if I had the protection, yeah. he, protection he was getting, I think I'd have given up as well. <laughs> yeah, I, no, you're not wrong. I think he was. He was just disgusted with the entire situation. He's like, I, I, I think you that guys are helping me. Yeah. I'm not helping you. So yeah. let's hope we all chalk that up as a learning experience and it doesn't happen again. <laughs> you see, that's why you need a good return game because there's nothing that pumps a team up more than a good, what, 30, yeah. 40, 50 yard. Flip the field. Return. Completely right. Controlling They're the field position. Right. I think if we win the toss, please can we kick it? 
So let's talk about the elephant in the room with that then. Do you think we ever tra- I entertain the idea of letting Antonio Brown return kicks? Mm. Mm. Ooh, I like that though. We did talk about that last time, but it, it, it didn't seem like it's in any of the coaches' minds, is it? I'll Why? Give you go- it's, it, you're right, it's not. They've actually talked about it as a solid no, but at, at this point, that's what I'm getting at is, is it's this this revolves back to our let's not be stale and do the same thing over and over or creativity. Why not give it a chance? Let's see what happens. I'll tell you what, if the coaches can't be any are, worse than what we're doing. I was gonna say if the coaches are watching this podcast, they're gonna say, Well, let's give it a go. Let's try. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I mean, clearly we're a great watch, guys. Don't switch off. But if the coaches are watching this Obviously, podcast, the coaches we've got are definitely another watching this, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. If, if four aeroplane tickets turn up tomorrow morning, they were watching it. <laughs> yep. I know we forgot to tell properly. them last week's show to not be stale. That's why they played the way. So we got this, everyone. We're on it. <laughs> but I think it's a really good part. I would love to see AB returning kicks. I think that's the best place he could actually fit in because that doesn't require chemistry. It doesn't require no. learning the playbook. It's catch the ball and run. It goes back to, to what was previously stated where, you know, special teams plays can really ignite the energy. And like you just said, what better place than him to be in a room where he's not going to create conflict or take away from others than to just go return some kicks if he has a couple big, big plays. I mean, people feed off that. And then while you're doing that in practice, you can actually start to scheme him. You know, those three or four or five plays that you actually they're the, yep. the AB gimmick plays a bit like... Um, you know, Taysom Hill, perhaps, you know, yeah. sort of, that sort of arrangement, you, you know, if you really want to get him in the ball game, scheme something for him rather than just trying to force him the ball on a play. Yep. And then one other thing that I saw this week is that barring injury, I think that Mr. McCoy is going to have the same fate you had in Kansas City last year and just be a game day, healthy and active. Mm-hmm. I think he's pretty much lost his roster spot from what I've seen. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. He's not mm-hmm. been on the field, has he, the last two or three games? At all. And like you touched on earlier, they're not going to start giving him snaps now over a rookie third rounder that I agree with you has been overly productive in his limited time. Keyshawn's looked fine when he was on the field, very capable. Yeah, completely. Yeah, I was going to say it also, you know, ty- word for Tyler Johnson as well. Caught a, caught a nice one, didn't he? You know, he, he What a great know. player he's become, right? He's, and yeah. all he does is go out there and do his job. That hit he took against the Giants and held on to that football – I even sent him a tweet. I go, most people didn't notice that, man. I want you to know that I did. And that's how you become a pro football player is making catches like that and doing your job. Good shit. Now it's time to uh, put your money where your mouth is. What's the score going to be? Our predictions on how it's going to go down. Phil, if we start with you. Um, 24-17 Buccaneers. I like it. Bucks by a score. Okay. Gary. Uh, I definitely think we bounce back. Um, bounce back pretty well 31-21 okay very good uh, Matt how are you going to call it I'm, I'm a maybe eternal optimist but I, I, I kind of in my head had a 38-24 I think oh. we get back to the, uh, the putting 35s on people being a machine um, it's a complete great bounce back opportunity I mean our defense will give up some points but I just look at like Carolina just gave up what I think 38 to the Chiefs um, it's not like their defense is some maven. So, yeah, I think we could easily put 38 on them. I would love to see that scoring, that because that's the thing that's going to scare other teams. They know our defense is good, but if we can start racking up points as well, that puts you, that's the thing that puts you over the fence into KC territory, doesn't yep. it? I uh, also want to yeah. say I wouldn't be mad at this. Um, at the end of the day, this is Super Bowl or bust mode if you look at our roster and how we've you know acquired it and, and built it. Um, I think you just simply put Chris Godwin, shut him down until after our bye week. You don't play him against the Rams. Don't play him against the Chiefs. There's no point in putting a guy out there with three fingers. That is, as we've seen, when he sits, our offense struggles. It's just a fact. He is very, very, very integral to the success of our offense. So playing him in those games, because we're in a spot right now at six and three, where you have a total, obviously, of seven games left. You have to go four and three. You get in the playoffs with 10 wins for sure. So Assuming we can beat the Panthers this week, that streaks to three. You have to win three of six. Um, I just, there's no need to be overworking a Chris Godwin in unnecessary games. You know, you, you say Chris Godwin, you know, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, uh, Matt. The other thing is, as well, I, I'm not convinced that Mike Evans, like Gary. Oh, said, he's still he's, hobbled. He's, he's not right. You know, they signed Antonio Brown for a reason, not because he's, you know, he's the one player to get us over the hurdle. I just think we need him. We've got two, our two receivers who are deemed to be some two of the best in the NFL. 
both both banged up. Yep. And, and they say Scotty's still got a little lingering concussion oh, in his yeah. shoulder. Yeah. Because I, I had big things for Scotty this year. I thought he was going to be, you know, the uh, Edelman. And well, all he's that, got great but... chemistry, is not he, with Tom? Clearly. Yeah. What we saw in Oakland, I think it set the unrealistic expectation for Bucks fans that it's going to be like that every week now. And they mm. still got to work on that, but it can get there. We saw flashes of what could be. If those two get on the same page, watch out NFL. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Cool. Okay, and then to round things out, my prediction, you may or may not like this, I think it's whoever gets the ball last, 28-21. I think this is going to go backwards and forwards. I, you know, I, I really hope it's us, but I'm a bit worried it's going to be the Panthers. And I, you know, I don't want to think about what happens if that happens, because I think the, 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 the headlines start to get a bit nasty. Uh, people start pointing fingers. So let's hope that I'm wrong. I love being wrong when I predict a loss. Um, so I think, yeah, if we can be the last people with the ball, I think we can win. So controlling the game, that's probably be a bit of game management, probably a bit of getting the running game going and not giving up. All I can say is you must like hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Bakewell, that's B A. <laughs> cool. Okay, well, once again, um, thank you so much, everyone, for, for watching and, and joining in with us. Give us your, your comments on, on YouTube and let us know what you think and what you think the score is going to be. Um, Phil and Gary, um, our regulars, it's been absolutely super having you. But Matt, thank you so much. We're so grateful with the time zones. It's like like God just doesn't want us to talk together online, but it's been <laughs> no brilliant. At all. I really, really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for having me and providing me the opportunity. I'd love to do it. And also, as I've always told everybody, I went over there when uh, the Bucks played you guys or played in London uh, last year. And I mean, the hospitality and just generosity of um, not just you guys personally, but just anyone I interacted with over there. I'll never forget it. It was wonderful. So thanks again. Fantastic. And we'll see you all next week. Goodbye. Sounds good. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.